Good afternoon, I'm Stuart Hennell and I'm here to talk about Watch Finder. Um, I do feel old compared to the rest of the, the watch guys here. We started in 2000 and in my humble opinion since then, we've sort of redefined the, the marketplace for pre-owned luxury watches just here in the UK. Um, so the theme, um, our product is our best marketing tool. Um, one of the problems we have is that the same problem as the guys have got, we're trying to create a brand in the luxury watch vertical. Um, I've, given, I've got quite a lot of slides here today, and I'm going to try and stick to the 10 minutes. So a lot of this will be for reference. I might run through some of these very quickly. Um, but I just want to touch on some headline figures we have here. Um, yeah, I, I think the key one for me is the turn on the inventory, um, and I'll repeat business at 35%. I've got some more generic stuff here, which is sort of, I call some of these sort of off balance sheet assets. Um, the tech platform that we've built is, is the main component of this, but we, we uh, omni channel approach, we have lots of stores, big internet, prop big online proposition, and um, I have an awful lot more responsibility now than I ever considered I would want. Um, just want to touch the start of the journey back in 2000. Um, you know, we started, it was good old fashioned. Um, yeah, bootstrapped organic startup of the spare bedroom variety. I literally started this in my spare bedroom. Um, it, it, it was learning by doing. Um, uh, it probably spent 10 years trying to refine the model, improve things for our customers. We look at this from the consumer perspective. We were constantly trying to make things better. Um, you know, we tried lots of different models. I know a lot about peer to peer, a lot about gray. Um, but I think the point is the lessons, you know, we don't ad adopt a prescribed solution, and the lessons we've learned have been pretty hard, uh, hard earned. So this is our model, getting back to solving the problem. This is the model that we really sort of um, um, uh, fell on in about 2010, really. Um, it was after the last sort of macroeconomic turndown where we realized that for us, we thought the holy grail would be to cut everyone out and, and buy from the members of the public. So here's, the, the, here's a very straightforward business proposition. It's nothing that you wouldn't have heard before. We buy the product, we own it, we have value to it, and we sell it using all our different platforms. Um, and we do that a lot. And we've done it more than anyone else ever. Um, so I'll start on the, the, the buy side. Um, there's, a, there's some do's and don'ts of, of how to buy inventory there that I'll let you ponder over. But the key thing for us was creating a supply chain. That doesn't exist. And I think even today, it doesn't really exist. Reliance on the trade, um, in my opinion, a big no-no. You know, the trades, they know what they're doing. They're very clever. They're not going to give their margins away. They understand that inventory is key. So what we had to do was create a supply chain here in the UK. And our online proposition is, in, in, uh, counterintuitively, it's more powerful at all to acquire inventory than it is to sell it. Um, so of the watches we buy, 90%, 90 plus percent are bought here in the UK directly from members of the public. Um, so we've developed, uh, you know, I, I understood long, long ago you had to take the emotion out of the acquisition. So we've digitized the knowledge and our database drives all our acquisitions. So if you ever get the opportunity to, to test the model, you have to go online, put the information in and the database will, will give you the quote immediately. And although it is quite sophisticated, it's based on some fairly simple propositions and there's a feedback loop to the sales side. Um, I've managed to take the humans out of the equation. Um, it, there's the process in a bit more detail. So you can see we protect, we protect ourselves on direct costs. I'll sort of let you look at that at, at, at your leisure. Um, but fundamentally, going back to the theme, if you buy the right watches, you know what you to buy, and you buy them at the right prices, actually, if it's the inventory that the consumers want, it markets itself. People come to you because you have something they desire. And especially in the pre-owned space where you're really not competing with you, you have discontinued models that no one else sells, you're in an extremely advantageous position if you know what you're doing. And that's easy to get wrong, by the way. Um, so once you've bought the right inventory, then it's about, in my opinion, it's about um, adding value. And you do that through the trust piece. So firstly, you, you need to make sure the inventory is, is you know, fit, for, fit for sale. And I've got it there, it's authenticity, working order. Um, it has to be in a condition that's comparable with new. Uh, provenance is also an issue. But you do that by building your own service center. So we have a, a fully independent service center in Maidstone. It's the biggest independent service center in Europe. We're accredited for lots of brands, as you can see there. Um, and that's the sort of beating heart of the value add around the inventory. You then have to build trust in the company. So um, again, a list of things we've done. Um, uh, you're sort of inculcating trust. 
Um, I've uh, trust pilot ranking, something that I spend a lot of time doing, got my own sort of customer service department that works very closely with me. I think we've got something like 10,000 five-star ratings now, and at 5,000 pound a watch, that's a sort of 50 million pound endorsement in what we do, so I'm quite proud of that. Uh, there's a trust journey, um, so you can see as we've grown over time, you can see the different elements that we've washed into the proposition. And the sell side, so this is fairly straightforward. Well, you know, once you've bought the right product and you've um, persuaded the consumer that, that you know, you're trustworthy and there's nothing going to go wrong with the transaction, then we just use our platforms. It's, as I said, omni-channel, we've got stores, we've got online, and, and there's, there's some data there. Something I just want to touch on is part exchanges. In my opinion, absolutely critical to doing this, this properly. Um, we think it's a, it's a USP that we have and no one else has globally. 25% um, of our transactions involve a part exchange. Um, obviously, it replenishes your stock, which is great when you're, you're, you're wholly pre-owned. Um, but interestingly, it also uh, rapidly increases the frequency and the velocity with which customers come back. So our repeat business is 35%, like I said earlier, but a lot of that's due to the fact that they, there's no depreciation in, in, in the watch when they buy it, so they're quite happy to trade back and transact much, much more quickly. Um, so if you know, we've adopted that model, it's fairly straightforward, but if you do it right, you can get some impressive results. So here's some, just some numbers. Um, you'll have, you know, it's a room full of educated people. You'll have seen stuff like this before. A couple of headline figures, turnover. So over the last, what, six years, you can see we double every two years. Um, I think you, know, you, you hear some interesting conversation about the margin in this piece. Ours is fairly static. It's not only static top line, it's static amongst the brands as well. Uh, EBITDA this year is very healthy, um, but I think you can see that the growth in the net margin isn't as good as you'd expect it to be, and I think we still have opportunities to leverage off the assets and the platforms we built to drive that margin up. Fully expect by the end of the year to that to be sort of 10% plus on the net EBITDA margin. So this is really interesting. So we talk about brand. So I've got here uh, a couple of snaps from Google. So here in the UK, when you measure how many times people type watch finder, um, you can compare that with some of the brands. And you can see, uh, since July 16, you can see uh, we've competed fairly well. These are the top four, by the way. So the only, the only watch brand that, that's better than us, if you want, brand equity-wise, is Rolex. Uh, here's a summary of some of the others in it, uh, September, so a given month. Um, and here we are against some of the primary players in the UK and some of the secondary competitors. So in summary, uh, I happen to think that the approach we've adopted is more challenging, it's much more difficult, um, it definitely has its own problems, but if you can do it properly, you can see these sorts of results, um, and that sort of brand equity piece speaks for itself. Um, very briefly, international expansion. Uh, it shouldn't be lost on you if we're turning over 120 million in the UK. There's, um, it's replete with opportunity to take this into new territories. Um, I, I, I'm sort of going to finish on the interesting point that both the guys have made already in that what are the brands going to do about it? How are the manufacturers going to interact with pre-owned? Uh, look at the car industry. There's your analogy. I'm a man of a certain age. 25 years ago, luxury car manufacturers um, sort of adopted pre-owned, they stopped looking at it as competitive, started looking at it as complementary, and I'm convinced the watch industry, that has yet to happen, and hopefully when it does, we'll be at the epicenter of that change. Uh, thank you very much.